we go. I shall now start the recording. Uh, today's topic is how do you move from an oligarchy or um, uh, dictatorship to a distributed organization? And I think this is, I mean, this is something natural that happens because uh, an organization starts with one person or two people and an idea, and eventually it evolves to have more people in it. And if you want, so there's always going to be some point at which it's run by a small group of people because there's only a small group of people. And then some groups have built into them to start with that kind of structure, and some have not built that in. And then um, we've seen in the industry different attempts and different levels of success at doing that. So that's the topic. Um, I would like to ask if anybody wants to be the facilitator for today. I don't happen to have a lot of opinions on this particular topic either. So, um, I mean, just relative, I mean, I have some, but just relative to my normal number of opinions. <laughs> Would anybody like to facilitate today? Thomas? Oh, I have to know. I've got too much to say on this topic. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, why don't you start out by saying, I'm, I'll continue to facilitate. If you've got a lot to say, I'll continue to facilitate. Why don't you start and say, okay, Mihao is just uh, listening yeah. mode for a while. Okay, great. I will. I will give you my brain dump of what comes up for me from the topic, and we'll see if anything in my brain dump seems interesting to anyone else. Uh, so um, I've been working on this exact thing for a client, um, and it's also part of um, a sort of a what might turn into a framework someday, some, some writing I've been doing on spinning up a brand new blockchain or uh, blockchain or DLT based organization that at some point. You know, it's just you trying to get some people to join you. And so you're the benevolent dictator for life because you're all by yourself. And then you invite some of your, you know, soft headed friends who are willing to waste their time on your harebrained idea. And it becomes the sort of, you know, select committee of the self appointed. Um, and the distinction at that point between a duocracy and, a, and an initial appointed committee is maybe hard to tell unless you decide to formalize a lot and go all static masculine at that point. Uh, and you may or may not have, you know, division of labor and assigned roles and responsibilities. Um, I would hope you would, but it may be too much trouble. Um, but at some point, you're going to try to attract folks who aren't true believers and aren't, you know, just so passionate about subject matter that they don't care how um, messy things are. And those late adopters, if you're familiar with the diffusion of innovation or the crossing the chasm um, phrase or the diagram that goes with it. Um, they're people who, they're not willing to buy in on vision. They want to buy in on some practicality. And especially for blockchain-based systems, one of the high items that they look for explicitly or implicitly, depends on the person, is some form of governance that makes them feel like it's not going to turn into two wolves and a sheep voting on what they have for dinner. Um, they want to see that they're interests are protected that there's some structural settings that will allow them to take the risk of making the investment to join this consortium or, or this setup and uh, and not be fleeced not be taken advantage of uh, down the road and so in order to cater to that preference um, we're seeing a lot of projects do some pretty you know elaborate formalizations um, the R3 Corda folks just went through a big song and dance around their governance to set up a brand new committee. It's all elected. Um, we're seeing a lot of the other folks. Uh, Hedera Hashgraph is going to great lengths to recruit lots and lots of very large companies to sit on their governance committee to try to, you know, demonstrate that it's real and solid and, um, not under the thumb of the technocrats inside of Hedera, but rather it's this solid stable thing that's controlled by a committee of solid stable people um, and and so on. Uh, so the, this pattern of going from inward looking, exclusive, select, true believers in a very small pond to a relatively formalized, um, apparently, uh, representative or 
um, the, maybe democratic or something, uh, open process with the structures and processes and a you know, clear set of rules that everybody follows, uh, that appears to be a very standard evolutionary step. And then yesterday I was reading about something called the iron law of institutions, also called the iron law of bureaucracies, um, or the iron law of oligarchy, depending on whose version you look up, which suggests that when any institution is around for long enough, it becomes captured by people who are more interested in the institution than they are in the mission of the institution. Um, so if you can imagine that there are you know, teachers who are passionate about teaching, and then there are teachers who are passionate about seizing control of the teacher's union. And they are probably not the same people, and they probably don't have the same agenda. And uh, any long running institution tends to breed folks like that, who mostly wanna play inside politics and mostly want to advance their own personal power inside the context of the organization that they're part of. And the actual mission of the organization is sort of a secondary or tertiary concern. Uh, and so you end up with the reemergence of oligarchies and elites and shadowy cabals behind the scenes pulling strings, or maybe not behind the scenes. Uh, so there may be a life cycle here of, uh, you know, initial flattening followed by a regression toward oligarchy over time. Okay, I think that's my brain dump. Well, it's interesting, you know, it's interesting that you say that because it's, it's, you know, this thing that you're talking about, for example, with the teachers unions, the teachers unions, I mean, again, these are all hierarchical systems, right? It wasn't designed that everybody should have, you know, the design of these isn't to be a decentralized organization. The design of them is to be a centralized organization. And also even what you were talking about, um, you know, in the crypto space, you know, bringing a cash graph. I haven't seen them actually release something. I was really, this is the second time I've heard their name this week and I haven't heard it for two years. So that was really exciting. But like that they're going to have this big board of directors. Again, a board of directors is representing uh uh a hierarchical structure. That's not saying all of our users are going to, have a say in it or all the people being represented. So that's, it's still like, you're still kind of talking within this, uh, the concept of a hierarchical organization to some degree. Or did I miss something that you said? Uh, I'm, I'm supposing that the evolution from initial cadre to broad uh, uh, membership is going to involve some form of representation in the executive ranks and or legislative that it may or may not be a, de a direct democracy uh, model. And even if it is a direct democracy model, I suspect you're still gonna have the, the, the plenary group, you know, select some agents to go carry things out for them. Uh, and I, I would be surprised to find a, a real world example of a large organization that didn't do some of those things. I, I kind of wanted to go into the wolves part of it, you know, like we're, we're starting with oligarchy and then we're ending in what? Like, you know, like, is there, a, is there an extremely bad other version, you know, like the sort of the wolves, you know, but also like the inability to make drastic decisions that might be necessary kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like what's the other extreme for you? Yeah, the, uh, if you're familiar with uh, Lelou's book, Reinventing Organizations, he talks about um, green organizations that are very purpose-driven. They're a reaction to the sort of orange uh, level of, you know, soulless multinationals that all they care about is profit. And so the reaction against that is organizations that care about something other than profit, like a mission, like, creating good in the world, triple bottom line, whatever. And they often run into, um, through a desire to get everyone to agree to everything, they run into um, paralysis from a, an attempt to get everyone to reach consensus on all points. Uh, and it's endless consultation and an endless chatter. Um, if you think about the, um, 
interconnectedness diagrams you'll sometimes see if you have you know three people there's three links between them if there's four people there's six if there's five people i forget what the number is at that point but it gets astronomically large very quickly as you get up to 10 11 12 people the number of internal communications you might have if you wanted to talk to everybody and if everyone wanted to talk to everybody the communication burden becomes uh staggering and, and uh painful so uh, that's why the teal supposedly is is better than green among other things um but yes there absolutely is a phenomenon where um, the value of harmony is placed ahead of the value of efficacy uh, and in public choice theory that's say that you know the, the cost of getting too unanimous is really high so what do you do and one option is just not to do anything that isn't unanimous in which case you get enough people that you'll do nothing because there's always somebody somewhere who didn't get the memo or doesn't agree or wants to be a stick in the mud or something uh, and the heckler's veto you know only needs one person uh, so yeah that's a that's a very real thing I would say another example might be the Icelandic constitution, right? Like that was given to the people to do, and then it kind of, it kind of went off, right? So. I don't know that story very well. Could you recap it? Yeah, I mean, I, like basically, I think that, you know, I think, I don't remember the whole thing, but it was like when the, you know, in the financial crisis, they kind of recovered and they decided to give it, the, the, like let the people create the constitution of the country and it came out fairly nonsensical and they had to kind of re, re, reconstruct it. It was something pretty, I don't remember the whole story, but it was something like that. Like when they gave the people the right to just rewrite the constitution, they didn't really get anything that was cohesive enough uh, to be useful. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I, love, I love that example. I mean, I feel like that's like you're missing some sort of synthesis layers, you know, like there's, there's everyone gets to participate, but then you also have to have some sort of like uh, synthesis, right? Like knowledge protocols. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, when I think about these issues of like creating an organization that is going to have everybody participate, I mean, my, my philosophy under this and with the experiment, for example, uh, is something like if it's going to influence you you should have a say now that doesn't mean you should have equal say and it doesn't you know but it does mean that if something is going to influence you you should feel that your opinion is heard that your interests are served like that that kind of thing and um and i think that there is this thing about like everybody included in everything like as if there's you know, there's only two extremes, like one is somebody, you know, a small group decides and the other is everybody decides everything. And then you get things like, oh, but what do you do about, you know, voter fatigue, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that if you look at the reality of how societies function, it, the reality is we're all involved in something. And I know everybody here is, because here we are, right? Volunteering our time for no good reason to be on this call to learn something about democracy because we care about it, right? Everybody's putting in some volunteer time for something that they care about it. And it might be being on, you know, their parents' association of their school, and it might be just picking up litter, right? And right. inside right. of that volunteerism, you're developing some level of reputation and some level of, of expertise in that particular realm. And so when I think about direct democracy and collaborative governance, I think about it like that, not that everybody is going to voice their opinion about everything. And that's why I don't really like liquid democracy. I'm like, it doesn't matter. Like, if I'm weighing in on the 10 issues or the, that are the most important to me and that I know the most about, that's good enough. And if everybody does that, that's enough. In some ways, it is like a combination of representative democracy, except the representatives are people who care the most and know the most about the issues. And the rest of the people, if they don't care enough, they don't get involved in that. And I think of that as a way to, you know, run an organization and, you know, and then, I mean, when I was in, you know, the, the best example I had, I was in the synagogue where it was run like that and anybody could be on any committee. And if you weren't on the committee, you just, you know, you tried not to complain about it. And if you complained enough, they put you on the damn committee because like, stop complaining, get on the committee. And so, you know, you tried not to complain because you knew if you cared about it passionately, people were going to put you on the committee, you know, or tell you to shut up. So something like that is what I imagine. 
What's this thing? Is it like Dunbar's number? It's like 127 people, like the sort of typical network size, something like this of humans. Like, and there's all this stuff that comes out around like, you know, people probably shouldn't, or even organizations probably shouldn't exist in more, you know, larger numbers than that because you lose, like humans have an optimal sort of like network size. And as soon as we get beyond it, we start losing, you know, like our touch on reality kind of in a way. You end up with these hierarchies that are sort of too moved away. Hey, I, I found something really interesting I'm going to tell you about was, um, it's a project called Bloxburg. And it's, um, it's Bloxburg. A, it's, it's Bloxburg. Great name. Yeah. It's amazing. And it's totally the Cecilia's name, but it's really amazing. Basically, it started with the Max Planck Institute, and it's like originally funded by the, the German government. It's just a research project, but they've gotten 50 universities now, and they're like adding, you just have to be a research institution. So that's their proof of authority hierarchy. That's their governance layer, is research institutions. Hmm. And um, they've got this you know, kind of incentivized democratic voting system. It's pretty simple. Just it kind of... you. If you stop voting, if you stop showing up to vote, you start getting less and less power to vote, and then you can gain it back again. It was really simple, um, and and it's great. I just I feel like it's like I've passed some gallstones. Like I'm finally not on an extractive blockchain anymore. Like wow, and and like the cost of the running the nodes. I mean, I get it that we're sort of in this hierarchical space now, but gosh, you know, once we get to the point of needing to to get beyond that. Uh, let's have a party because for now, like it's, it's such a security. Yeah. Um, well, I want to say about Dun. what I want to say about Dunbar's number when we had a whole talk about that, but that's a whole rabbit hole, but is there's a lot of people who would like you to believe that, um, you know, that it's really clear that anybody in power, would you like you to believe that you can't do without them? So, Anything that I, you know, any, any scientific fact that a lot of people in authority would love me to believe, I try to, you know, think a little bit harder. Secondly, the problems that we're having in the world are at the global level, right? We, you, you know, we have to make decisions about global problems and having 150 people doing that just doesn't, you know, it doesn't pass. But then we get situations like we do where the World Health Organization can't decide whether you're supposed to wear a mask or not. I mean, this is just insane, right? So, and then the third thing is Dunbar's number is referring to the human brain. Like how much, how many people can I remember? But how many people can my phone remember? And how many reputations of people can my phone remember? Like any number. So if we have some good ways of knowing who's reputable and who isn't reputable and who we can trust and who we can't trust, it's like now you can pick from all kinds of restaurants and you can pick from all kinds of hotels and vacation spots and Uber drivers based on their reputation. And you don't have to know them, but when you're, you know, when you go and you host somebody in your Airbnb, you have enough information to say yes or no, I want this person. And so Dunbar's number isn't relevant in that world anymore because we've created mechanisms where I don't have to store everybody's reputational data in my head. I can actually say to my phone, okay, I, you know, we're dealing with pollution in our waterways. And, you know, we've done some studies. We know it's these and these materials. Please find me the top thousand experts who've done cleanup uh, from those specific materials from around the world in, you know, in areas that are, you know, whatever it is, you know, moderate temperature, and it'll find me those people. So I, the, the Dunbar's number concept is like There's no nothing longer about relevant. Them, though. There's nothing about that that doesn't say that groups can't combine and share information and everything like that. I, and I'm not saying that like we have to stick to groups of 150 humans. I'm just saying like, the, the amount of people you can know, it does mean something, right? And, and not in all cases, it doesn't, you know, we don't have to design governance uh, because of Dunbar's number. And, but I think thinking about small units connecting to each other, I think is great. And especially on blockchain, like we don't necessarily need a blockchain, right? Like for everybody, of course not, right? Like, and, and that's, that's kind of old news. Like all the new structures around like sharding and everything is about small structures combining, right? And yeah, there's still probably some dudes that are designing the combining algorithms and protocols, but still like, I, 
I mean, even in programming circles and stuff like that, like it's really, once you get beyond 150 programmers on a project, oh my gosh. I mean, I just think it's a limit. There, there is some limitation to human attention span and, you know, connectivity and everything like that. That's good to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree that scaling is, is more about uh, the connected fractalization than actually scaling one group capacity to something huge and I feel like when it goes to a very large number um, it might be easy for some type of uh, scapegoat mechanisms to be created because it's very It becomes almost like a like a prison system. If a person has a very bad reputation score, um, to reintroduce these people into into the accepted reputation circle, it feels um, it feels harder and harder because they are pushed out of the relational circles where changes, effective changes, actually happen. So I think the the small fractals adds a component of community relationship and and how we can transform each other by interactions and and reestablish our our social growth within the group and then expand to other fractals rather than just like pushing people out and out to the edges of society Yeah, I mean, so that's relating to rehabilitation. I mean, I think that whenever you look at any um, organism, right, if you look at human organizations and cultures that have excommunication, most of them have rehabilitation capabilities. And so that's saying, what you're saying is build that in. Um, but just going back to this transition, like, has anybody, does anybody, has anybody seen, like, what are some of the areas where we've seen organizations making these transitions to being more uh, inclusive and what's worked and what hasn't worked. So for one of the ones that was recent, I'm trying to get them to come to talk next week, um, is the Diversify group, which was, um, this is a, this is a, um, a decentralized exchange and they promised from the outset they would take 50% of the transaction fees from the exchange and allow the traders, the, the people who are holding their tokens, um, based on their actual activity, to decide what to do with those funds. And it got to a few, quite a few million dollars. I don't know, it was seven or 15, it was a lot of money. And they actually moved that all onto DAO Stack and gave, they called it the Nectar DAO, and they actually did give, they, they made that transition. I think as far as the coding goes, it's still coded by that group of people, but, um, the decision making actually was given to all the users of the platform of what to do with the funds that they made through the platform. So that was, I mean, that's still ongoing. It's about, I think it, they launched it maybe a little bit, maybe half a year ago or something like that. So that's one of the examples that I saw and that was specifically, and, and that was specifically about the funding, but also Diversify had um, given the power of deciding what to list on the exchange to the traders themselves, and they do that through a deliberation process. So that's a, a very, that, that's one of the very interesting successful models that I've seen is that, um, you know, these particular founders have given a lot of the power over how the exchange uh, makes decisions to the actual users of the exchange. So that's one example that I've seen um, that worked. Um, quite surprising, but happened. And then on the opposite side, it was Kyber DAO, I think. Kyber um, took a few thousand dollars and put it into DAO Stack, again, uh, DAO Stack DAO for Kyber DAO. And they um, got tremendously good results, like for 5,000 bucks or whatever, it was a small amount of money. They got all these great marketing proposals from people who did all their marketing and it was really successful. But the founders took a look at that and said, well, yeah, but why would I give up the rest of my money to other people? I'm going to stay in control. 
So that's an example of where, even though it was clearly um, very cost effective, like incredibly cost effective to put the marketing budget, the founders didn't um, feel incentivized or interested in taking that next step. So um, those are just two examples that we saw over the last year of uh, DAOs either moving from oligarchy or not moving from oligarchy. Um, love to hear if anybody else has some examples. Uh, uh, welcome, welcome, Maroon. Or I don't know how to spell you. We're talking. I don't know if you got the topic that we're talking about. Is uh, is uh, moving from oligarchy to uh, or to, to uh, inclusive democracy or DAO? Yeah, I mean, how? Yeah, 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 totally. I, I saw the uh, the prompt. Sounds like a really cool discussion. Uh, cool. It, it's yeah. pronounced Oren, but Oren. however you want to say it is all good. Oren. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, Oren. Yeah, Grace. So uh, and hi, Oren. Uh, I have quite a few examples, but mostly from the startup world, and it's also kind of related to to the nodes. Um, and in general, you know, like some of the examples we might know is Compound, Bitcoin, and also some of the startups. But I'll go kind of you know like one by one. So uh, one thing that we did not mention early on is what kind of organizations are we talking about, right? Because let's say a DAO would have slightly different way of organizing and purpose versus a startup versus a large corporate versus a government entity or an NGO, right? So I mostly work in the startup world and some people define a startup as an organization looking for a repeatable, scalable and sustainable business model. So now you start usually with a few founders and the problem is that you have, you're kind of on life extension all the time until you get to this, what you call product market fit. So you need to make it happen and to make it happen, you need to make decisions fast and sometimes wrong decisions but fast decisions are still better. So in that sense, you know, for startups, it's really important to be able to change direction really fast because if they, on, they are on the wrong track, they won't have enough time to just course correct, right? And that also comes to some of the blockchain organizations and this kind of progressive decentralization because Bitcoin is arguably, you know, decently decentralized, but because it was decentralized fairly, fairly early, it's very difficult to move all the people in one direction or the other. So it's fairly resistant as far as blockchain projects go because there are a lot of people involved. There is you know, like a lot at stake, but it's very difficult to make any changes. So on the opposite side, you have efficiency where the founders decide everything, uh, but then it can have some, some downside. So you know, going to the example of Compound, Compound you know, like is making the news recently for, for different reasons, but um, I, I listened to the interview, or actually two interviews, uh, between him and the, the lady from Unchained uh, podcast. And they were discussing this progressive decentralization. So they always had an assumption to decentralize, but only after they, ma they made sure that the system that they have is resilient enough. Uh, and you know, they have enough aligned actors inside so that when they kind of concede the decision-making power, it still stays on track to, to uh, the original vision and it doesn't crumble. Um, so uh, there was this example that they defended, uh, defended a specific attack and there was another company in a decentralized finance space that they had this um, kind of master key for the contracts and they messed it up really badly despite the fact that they had the control because they didn't have those, those uh, solid foundations. So uh, one of the things that, that came to my mind, you know, this kind of realization is that you are okay to decentralize um, when removing the founders doesn't impact or shake up the organization. So uh, there are examples in the startup world. There is this company in the AA space in the UK. I don't remember the name. There was also an interview between them and uh, Azim Ashar from Exponential View. Um, there is 47 signals, I believe, the guys who wrote Basecamp and a few other companies, especially in the gaming industries, which operate very flat organizations where you decide what you work on, you know, like you decide the pay and other stuff like that. And it's very little oversight, but they have a very solid foundation and very, very good group of people that, you know, uh, makes it okay. So if, let's say, I'm a, I'm a startup founder or I'm a blockchain founder, if, let's say, uh, Vitalik uh, Buterin, you know, passed away, you know, it's quite likely that Ethereum would be, would be shaken up. But if one specific core developer in the Bitcoin community, you know, like passes away or is hit by a bus, you know, Bitcoin will keep on going, right? So this is, this is kind of like what, what I'm realizing one of the cues when you're okay to, you know, concede the power uh, and move to this kind of, you know, new stage. And then, you know, two things about the Dunbar's number. So one thing that I realized while listening to it 
is that corporates are very different beasts. So why you have this corporate hierarchy and why you can have companies of 20,000 people is because they focus on efficiency. So there's efficiency in decision making, there's efficiency in information processing, there's efficiency in work, right? So they can go beyond this Dunbar's number because they are much more efficient at passing information. And again, based on my understanding, Dunbar's number is mostly about having uh, decent intimate connections between people. So um, Grace often talks about membrane and you know some, some people talk about membranes. So it's much more difficult to have a very close, intimate, regular, um, you know, sustaining healthy relation with, with um, you know, 150 people versus five people. You just don't have, you know, like enough time. And we're social animals wired for specific expectations. So yes, we might go beyond this 150 people, but then we probably need to look differently at our social norms because, uh, you know, you probably won't prefer to have five or 10 friends that one and a half thousand friends or connections on, on Facebook. It's just not the same. Uh, not the same time of, type of relationship, but again, you know, if we have solid enough structures, um, we can we can ex extend those. Um, so yeah, a, a kind of a long-winded answer, um, but uh, I think it will be great to kind of specify what kind of orgs we are most interested um, in terms of focus, because government, you know, for governments it will be very very different. I love that. I love the description of like, you know, you don't, you don't like scale something until you can like kind of break it a little bit first and see that it still survives, you know, I really like that. But I, I, for me, I'm a, we're, we're trying to build public infrastructure, right? And so the concept of public infrastructure, like it doesn't really fit very well in the corporate world, right? Because you want it to be as cheap as possible to maintain. Right, you don't want someone making profit on public infrastructure. It doesn't make sense. You know, I mean, if if they're profiting, they're sort of extracting from the system. Uh, you know, and maybe it can handle a little bit of that. But if it becomes, you know, like a leech, it's it's such a hard thing. And I I, I feel like a lot of blockchain has this feel of public infrastructure being built. You know, we're we're trying to sort of wade through it, like a DAO and all these kind of technologies that can be built on blockchain. To me, they fit right into public infrastructure and the for-profit model. Like it, to me, it's just a. It's I, I get that it incentivizes some innova innovation, but to me, it really crushes a lot of innovation. I think like the technology we've had for years, we could have done so much more with it if we just hadn't been waiting for you know X Y Z patents or you know like oh my God, I mean just even trying to get people interested in public infrastructure is a, always a battle like, oh no, you know, like how much, how much do you pay for that? Right? it's like, okay, well, yeah, it's really hard to develop. And maybe, maybe the technology we have now will sort of evolve into some form of public infrastructure, you know, like all the rats will manage to turn the wheel somehow, you know, but uh, I don't know, I don't know if it will. Well, well, super interesting point, but to be honest, I don't think we even need to go to the digital sphere. One, well, actually two really good examples of public infrastructure that I know of are roads. So most of the roads uh, or highways in Poland, they are paid. So you need to pay at all. And most of them are owned by public private partnerships. I also lived in Portugal where they also made those paid highways. The, uh, the difference there was that if there was a, a profit, it would go to the private hands. But if there was a shortfall, then the public, um, part of the partnership would need to pay. <laughs> and then, you know, if you go to Florida, again, uh, I-95, which is you know, the most congested, most used highway is also paid. It's, you know, like you have tolls and, and uh, there is a specific entity that is extracting money from out of it. So, so you know, I understand, you know, public, public should be as affordable as it can because if there's profit, someone profits. And the other example is um, electric grids. So my background is actually in energy. And one really interesting case more than a decade ago was that Australia was one of the first countries that decided to sell off their transmission grid, which is normally very uncommon because this is critical infrastructure. So you want to keep it in the national hands usually. And now what happened is, you know, because of this US and China scuffle and China doing some things on a, on a global scale, um, Australia is now fighting because they sold off their, their transmission grids to the Chinese and it's owned by, you know, like co Chinese corporations. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of implications for that because this, this is a public, 
Australian infrastructure, but someone else with potentially different interests, and you know, uh, maybe different security interests or or profit interests, is in control of that, uh, which is which should be public, right? So my question here would be, you know, what could be the type of organization that could oversee and sustain this public infrastructure? Um, with the uh, with the Aussie stuff, it wasn't just uh, the the power grid. There's also like the, the public transit. Uh, infrastructure was privatized in the same way uh, a, a bunch of the uh, the um, road infrastructure was privatized in the same way uh, <laughs> quite a bit of the healthcare system was privatized in the same way um, there was a, a, a period uh, in the kind of I guess late 90s early 2000s that that there was a whole bunch of different privatization there that's now having those kind of flow on ramifications it's like you know <laughs> It's like a double reverse mortgage, you know, like everyone knows it's not a good idea, but somehow that was passed. That just, that just happens, you know, these huge governments. So my thinking around public infrastructure is that like you do want the right size grids for it, you know, like you want that sort of resolution that deals with that problem, whatever it is. And, and this might not be regional grids, but you know, you've all kinds of grids, you know, um, it, with the currencies that we're, we're developing, that's the idea is that, you know, they've all got their own sets of contracts, but there are protocols that connect them to each other, you know, and, and you still end up with, you know, like siloing around the development and the software. But like, again, the end goal is that people have a public infrastructure to create their currencies, you know, and, and develop kind of reserves that connect them together. And there's a way to pass, you know, between all of the currencies. And so it's like, you want to design in our case, like such that you're not needed anymore, which is hard to do, especially if you're for profit, right? Like, I mean, you're, you're, you're in fact, it's almost like illegal for a for profit to design like that because you'd be screwing your investors essentially. Um, yeah. That, that's certainly a dilemma. Um, if it's a for profit, then the investors are uh, at the forefront. But if it's a not for profit, then there's the issue of inefficiency and uh, incentivizing and um, making the whole thing run. I think in Germany before there was an issue with um, the train system, and it's now a private public um, mix thing. It's not a public, um, in, although it's a public infrastructure, it's not. Um, publicly owned um, with some degree of increase in efficiency, but also not completely uh, problem solved. Um, I don't know, what do you guys think would be a solution to this public-private dilemma? Could, could it be a different system? Um, could something completely not known replace it? Or are we stuck in somehow this dilemma between public or private in terms of our resources. So Analoa, I will, I will give you a quick answer, then I will shut up uh, and go for a walk and listen again. Um, you know, there, there are people already doing stuff. So there, again, there's a very interesting interview with a guy who co-founded uh, Kickstarter. Uh, and he explains this notion of public benefit corporation and how in their articles on incorporation, they made sure that their responsibility is to stakeholders, including artists, not only shareholders. And then, you know, it has impact on your funding and so on. And I don't want to complain much about NGOs, but NGOs are in a bit unhealthy dependent relationship, uh, which I didn't think about like much before until I had a conversation last week because um, non-profit, well, some, not really non-profits, but non-governmental organizations, they are uh, dependent on donations. And then the people who donate, they can um, implicitly dictate what the organization does because, you know, like uh, the, the nonprofit or NGO cannot make their own money. So they need to get the donations. But if a donor says like, I'm not going to give you money unless you don't have much to do, right? If you're, if you're lying on some of the donors. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we were getting there to get kind of like more sustainable models. Uh, a lot of, like in my circles, a lot of people are talking about this donut economics and, you know, like stakeholder capitalism and, you know, social things. Um, it's still fairly early. 
and yeah, we either live in the exa uh, existing system, as Will and Oren mentioned, you know, like we already, like US has already privatized healthcare, you know, like how do you go back? <laughs> if a lot of people or company, companies have a lot of interest, not to lose it. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to kind of bring up the, and welcome Joachim, I had asked um, him to come because uh, also somebody from Haifa and Seeds, and I know they have a whole plan on how to move from this very small core group to the bigger group. So um, I'll ask you to share a little bit about that now that you've joined, because we were just talking about examples. But um, one of the interesting things, even with nonprofit, with both nonprofit and for profit, right, is this issue of birth and death. And I think, um, and, and what do I mean by that is like, if you've given birth to this thing, like you created this thing, like you feel this ownership and you don't want to let it, you know, this founder syndrome, right? Like, I don't want to let other people run it. They're going to have a different vision than me. And so there's that going on. And then there's this thing about death. So how you were talking about how the, you know, that that either consciously or subconsciously or implicitly or explicitly, if you're a nonprofit, you're beholden to your donors because they're keeping you alive. But another thing that happens is that in, in nonprofit world is that because um, if you solve the problem, you would have to close your nonprofit. There's actually an interest, right? You've got a job at this nonprofit, which is solving this problem. And if you actually solved it, you'd be out of a job. And so there's this kind of intrinsic, you know, some of it is like this kind of fear of death. Like, what if we close the company? I've got a brand and it's got an identity. And what if it dies? Like, even though it's not really alive, as well as this you know, self-interest, like I'm in charge of it. And if we actually solve the problem, I won't have a job anymore. So those are kinds of things that have people keeping to concentrating the power. So. So, yeah. so you can be an NGO and you can, you can just be a service, you know, you can provide services. You're just not allowed to have shareholders and profits around it, right? So like the, the idea for at least the NGOs I know that are good are the ones that are providing some long-term service. They have a stake in the, other words, They're, they are, you know, an institute that's doing X, Y, and Z. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, it's a tough, it's a really tough situation, but I, I, for me personally, it just I I would rather be a very very poor activist than anything else. You know, that's the I guess that's a point of pride in a way, maybe luck as well. Yeah, well, yeah, it's also an issue, right? Like it's what drives you. And um, cool, I'd love to hear some more examples about transitions between you know small group of founders to you know more democracy and how people are seeing that or planning for that. Yeah, this is something that, um, that Colony is, is kind of actively working towards at the moment, is essentially going from a, uh, you know, a, a software stack that's owned and controlled and, and uh, you know, only controlled by uh, you know, a, a relatively small group of people or, or an entity that's run by a relatively small group of people to essentially handing off the network to its community. Uh, I mean, that's something that's been planned for since its inception, uh, but it's, it's now uh, kind of, I guess they're working towards that, the kind of pointy end of actually executing on that transition, uh, which is, is gonna be really interesting to, uh, to see uh, in terms of what that looks like. Uh, right now, the, the colony network uh, you know, like the, the, the deploy keys, I guess, for the colony network, the people who can, who can you know, create a network upgrade um, is a relatively small number of people who have direct kind of commit access to the, the repos and then uh, who have, who have um, permissions in the colony network to actually uh, trigger an upgrade. Um, that, uh, those permissions will be uh, handed off to basically given to like the meta colony which is a, a colony that will then be kind of responsible for coordinating those uh those deployments um and uh in turn the, the meta colony will be essentially transitioned from kind of being directly controlled by individuals to uh being mediated by a reputation uh to to make things happen so instead of instead of me having the kind of unilateral decision making power to hit a deploy button it'll be um uh, essentially, uh, uh, anyone with reputation in that meta colony can um, 
initiate a motion to make a, a deployment happen or make an upgrade happen or, or kind of change any other kind of network variables. Um, and then there's a uh, essentially a, a reputation weighted dispute resolution process if people disagree with that motion. Um, the, I, I think this goes along with, uh, I forget who was saying it earlier on, but the idea of, uh, of kind of starting with a relatively uh, small concentrated team that can kind of work uh, in a fairly agile way uh, and put, put something out in the wild, find bugs, break it, get it to a point where it's, uh, it's you know, stable and, and actually worthwhile uh, distributing, uh, I, I think is, is, is a really viable path. And in terms of like a, 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 the, the for-profit part of it, the for-profit entity, like Contity, uh, Colony, uh, the, the legal entity, uh, I guess as a, as a for-profit entity, we, we're not, um, I don't know, there's, you talked about, uh, someone talked about the, um, being kind of beholden to, to uh, shareholders and to kind of driving profit for shareholders, shareholders. And I think that's really dependent on the, um, the kind of fiduciary responsibility that you actually set up when you, when you incorporate your, your organization and when you decide to take on any kind of shareholders. Uh, that that's pretty flexible um, and it is up to the, what kind of structure you set up. Uh, luckily in Colony's case, that, um, that responsibility has all been in kind of, I guess, tokens, uh, Ethereum based tokens, uh, network tokens, as opposed to um, company stock. So the, the, the responsibility there is to deliver on the network and get the network functioning and, and uh, uh, kind of providing value. Uh, so I think that's a really good way to kind of align incentives with uh, the the early investors uh, and the, the kind of success of the network and the progressive decentralization of the network. Cool. Any comments on that or people want to show some other examples? Uh, I recall a reverse example. So there's a Chinese company studied by guys from Netherlands who are called Corporate Rebels, uh, which went through five, uh, like five phases of restructuring. And the latest one was actually break down this monolith corporate um, into smaller groups uh, of kind of, you know, small, medium enterprises and create an ecosystem out of it. And it worked very well for them. And now they're actually, you know, kind of exporting this model to, to different companies. Nice. Hey, our kind of philosophy around like being a service is that you, you accept your token in that service, right? So whatever that service is, so like if we've got a community group and they back it with their goods and services, literally like tomatoes and, and whatnot, they're producing a token, right, that they're going to use as a medium of exchange and they're committed to accepting it for their services. So it's sort of like your gas in a blockchain, right? You're, you know, you, there's sort of this algorithmic commitment in that sense. And what's nice about a blockchain or this idea of permissionless contracts is that every entity that can write to that blockchain can create those contracts, right? And they can interact with one another and they can kind of do it on a, on a, on a sort of a fair scale in a sense. And like, they can they can also create an organization in the sense that they are you know they're they're issuing some sort of commitment into a network they're creating their tokens we have a collateral mechanism with a bonding curve as well so you can kind of trust it hey you hey, hey guys hey um so anyways i i like that idea of that sort of fractal of service providers right and and that might be regional it might be product base um and they they all have, you know, bonded tokens, so they're convertible all to each other as well. But there's a certain weight to them. There's a certain trust in it, in a sense. And uh, and it's a pretty much completely flat hierarchy. You could have a mountain range of different reserves, the the bonded asset behind them, and those can get very hierarchical. That's that's the realm of like stable coins and stuff like this. Um, and uh, anyway, that's how we're thinking about it. In, anyways, this sort of like mountain range of reserve currencies probably some uh, you know the, the most uh, uh non-authoritarian uh, uh, like basket of goods and services for that region being a a reserve that communities can choose as well and 
you'll end up with some overlap on that sort of stuff but yeah and it's just navigating the space around that like doing bridging contracts and you know do you use die or do you use uh you know what what stable coin do you like you know usdc or with the gold token or oh man there's just you always run into these levels of like you know hierarchy kind of taking over and then you just like okay somehow we're going to push through that one as well and then you know eventually everything becomes a public service in my view. cool i know that joachim asked for for a screen sharing right so i bet he has something cool to share with us <laughs> yeah okay good Thank you, thank you, Grace. Uh, okay, I, I'll, I'll show you a few slides um, with our current thinking on uh, Haifa Seeds. You know, Haifa is uh, uh, the kind of project that spawned Seeds, the community world kind of currency out that we are now experimenting with, um, with, you know, using the Seeds Passport and some other dApps here. So very much like the notion of uh, seeing dApps as an ecosystem, seeing organizations breaking down into an ecosystem, that, that's a great way of uh, looking at uh, distributing, decentralizing the work we are doing. Um, so, so let me show you a few slides here, the latest uh, on our governance thinking. Um, can everybody see this? Yep. Um, so for me, it falls down into, into it breaks down into a sort of wayfinding, right? So developing a, a, a better way of working together in these overlapping spaces, right? So how, how can we all work together in these spaces? And as Grace mentioned, you know, we started with sort of the core teams here. This is uh, the work we're doing at Haifa. So Haifa is sort of uh, the, the organization to boot up and build, build the ecosystem, right? invite the other participants, find the others out there. And to me, this core team really is about enacting decisions. This is more of a converging governance uh, model that we have, where we have dedicated work teams, you know, uh, we just are you know, ready to um, work and, and break decisions down into these circles and parts that we're creating. So to me, it's kind of the first order governance here, right? That's happening inside the work teams. So very dedicated groups, they have boundaries, um, and we invite people into these different spaces to make decisions together, right? Um, but further out there, you know, we have the wider community. We have the seeds community around, uh, around uh, the work we're doing at Haifa. And this to me is more about creating possibilities, right? So these are communities, alliances, these are people who have uh, many, many different ideas that they want to bring in, bring to fruition. So for me, this is kind of a second order governance that feeds into this to say what is happening in these wider circles around that. Um, but then it doesn't stop there. It's really uh, going then into what I call a third order governance where, where I see more of the, the meaning making happening. This is where you overlap into the bioregions, you know, further wider coalitions that are out there and bringing them together. Um, so if, if you look at this in terms of scale and scope, for me, uh, it breaks down into these, these three uh, different scales, right? So there's organizational here at the, at the beginning, which is uh, the highly structured, nested, fractal work we're doing inside the work teams, very goal-oriented, right? Um, and uh, this is where we need to make quick decisions, enact staff, you know, that uh, we, we uh, uh, figure out from, from these higher layers, right? So a very typical organizational decision making. But then um, since Haifa is very much involved in, uh, in bi-regional aspects, um, so I like Michael when you said about, you know, looking at this from a regional aspect, that's, that's really critical for us to say who's out there, what is, what is a bi-region first of all, right? How do you define that? Where are the boundaries of that? Then who's inside the bi-region? What kind of activities are happening within there? How can we coordinate and assess you know, uh, proposals that are happening um, in these different bioregions um, and, uh, and make that vi visible, accessible to participants, right? But that, that doesn't stop here again, right? Because SEEDS is out to, you know, you know build a network of, uh, you can call it world citizens, you can call it, uh, you know, SEED citizens. By the way, I actually recently came across this book here, um, uh, called Passport to Freedom, which is uh, Gary Davis' work. Um, on world citizens. I actually met him, you know, 
before he passed away about uh, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago. Um, and uh, he talked about uh, what it means to become a world citizen. So he's, he's someone who actually renounced his citizenship, his US citizenship, and became a sort of non, uh, non-resident alien and, and created his own passport and was able to create a whole organization around that. And, and today you can actually apply for this world passport um, and receive it and some countries accept that as a, as a legal document so you can travel and obtain visas for that. So I thought that is a great context also for further rethinking what it means to become a world citizen, kind of a nationless, you know, you know, governance network, you know, where boundaries don't play that important role suddenly anymore. It's about you, it's about you as an individual uh, wanting to be present in, in these different spaces around the globe. So there's some fascinating aspects uh, I want to explore further in terms of uh, what that means to become a world citizen, really. Um, but I wanted to show you one more, two more slides, maybe, um, about uh, uh, the notion of boundary objects and protocols. So for me, if we, if we have these different scales, right, and within each of the scale, there's a scope of, okay, what's the specific scope for a given bioregion? Let's say Costa Rica, Guatemala is a bioregion, right? Um, within that, that uh, scope, what, what do we do? You know, what are the different activities? What are the uh, challenges and quests we want to create here, right? And, and that comes, goes back now to sort of creating uh, these boundary objects. So if challenges and quests are boundary objects that can be created by anyone in the network, um, and currently we're looking at, uh, at co-makery, um, they, they provide beautiful tool sets to bring people, teams, you know, set them on missions, right? So why not have co-makery focus specifically on creating the missions, assembling the teams, right? Finding the right roles and skill set to build what they want to build and then do the funding too, right? Uh, but then define that as, as a boundary object, um, like a quest or a mission that uh, people want to go on. And then you can take these boundary objects and make them visible across the different uh, scales, right? You can bring that into a global scale and say, hey, there are quests happening down here in this uh, bioregion for, say, Guatemala, interested in that. Or um, we can bring it down into the, uh, the DAO level. So we're building the, the DHO, the DO, which is Decentralized Human or Decentralized Holonic Organization at that level. And uh, that's the quest that's now you know, visible in that context. What does that mean? So here you can pick up roles, you can pick up uh, the, the assignments and, and, and uh, the circle structure in order to get the quest done, right? Um, so, so that's an object that can you know, be moved between the different uh, uh, boundaries here through what's called uh, boundary protocols, right? That's something that uh, is a concept that uh, was coined by Susan Starley in, in the 80s. Um, and I think it applies, really readily applies today in uh, the, the spaces we're building where we create, you know, these, these fluid experiences, people moving in and out of these spaces and boundary objects as sort of almost like tangible entities that move between these spaces. So I think that's an important uh, uh, element, you know, a structural element that we want to build into our governance uh, structure and uh, governance system. Okay, one more thing, then I'll, I'll stop here. Um, that's something very tangible here on the circle level. So we, we recently talked a lot about circles um, and how we make decisions within circles. Um, and our mantra now is circles and purpose all the way down. So that means, you know, you can define as many circles as you want in your structure, um, but we're mapping um, what we call sort of a root level structure, a root level circle to, to all of this. And that can map to these collaborative spaces. Um, an example here, we just moved to Discord um, as our main, you know, conversation uh, channel and tool. And uh, we can now start to map these root circles to Discord and continue the conversations in, in these different sub-circles, right? Um, be that trust flows, sweet, uh, that's more of a financial, you know, strategic circle or design and product development. Um, so that breaks down neatly into these sub-circles here. And uh, we're also aligning our budgeting process now to, to this uh, root circle structure. So we can all trickle down to as many sub-circles as we want. And since token 
tokens came up here, we also align our voice token. So Haifa has a specific voice token for participating in, in, these, uh, in the votes. Um, so each person has uh, an amount of voice tokens that he or she can apply for their own decision making in the circle, right? And what we are doing with the root circles is to say, you have a higher voice within a given root circle than you have outside that circle. So we want to make sure that all the participants really have a strong voice to make the decisions in here. People who are not directly involved, they have less uh, voice over, over the decisions that are happening there. Um, that's something that's coming next into, you know, build that into the door um, where we create the circle as an object. It's another boundary object, right? And then uh, identify who's in that circle in what kind of capacity. And uh, then we can uh, allocate the different voice uh, tokens to, to the people who are already there. Um, so there's some exciting work, you know, coming in, in the Haifa DAO um, in terms of governing um, the different teams in, in the circles um, on, on that level here, right, for work teams and organizations. What we're going to do next is also expanding that to um, other organizations so they can uh, take advantage of the very same thing that we do for Haifa now, but do that uh, across other organizations in the future. I'll stop here, sorry. I'm seeing we're already over time, Grace. <laughs> oh no, this is a 90 minute call, we're not over time. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is I, this is a 90-minute call, but I'm sure people have questions about it. I mean, for me, the question is like on the ground, what are you seeing around that transitions? Because I know I started like with the organization early and the commitment to be like a core team member was a lot. Um, and I haven't like rejoined yet, like it's like on my schedule, but like what's happening to the people who were in the periphery who said, okay, I don't want to give that 20 to 30 hours a week as a core team member. Are you starting to see them come in now? And how is that working? I'm like actually curious on the ground, like what's that starting to look like? Right. So, so if you mentioned on the ground, there could be in two places in the virtual ground, right? This is actually the operational teams putting the stuff together in Haifa, right? But then we also have the physical ground, which is the bi-regional work, you know, the villages, right? The permaculture groups who are actually doing the work on the ground there. Um, so we're supporting both. Um, so so the, 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 the physical real stuff um, is now sort of handled by our ambassadors. So we created an ambassador network uh, with people whose function and role really is to reach out to people on the ground, see what their concerns is and how can we bring them into the wider network. Um, and make really make that more visible. I mean, that's we're building a lot of maps now to say where are you on the bigger map, right? Can we connect each other? You know, building these networks. I don't know if you've seen Joe Brewer's uh, recent uh, talk on actually uh, creating a governance model for an entire continent, right? Where you connect these uh, individual bioregions and learning centers, as you want to build, the, like a network of learning centers, right? Um, a way to to find each other that way. And that's very much aligned with our thinking is to say, put them on the map, where are you? Let's connect to each other. Um, but I just don't want to stop at just using, say, a common currency for introducing um, these uh, local community processes, but say more about these, these boundary objects, how we can work uh, even further you know, across these different uh, uh, areas. Uh, to define what do you mean by you have a challenge? What do you mean you want to send people on a quest that's a larger project over a course of a couple of months? How do we fund that? And how can we take that object now and say, okay, if others want to participate in both virtual capacity, right, because you're not there on the ground, right, but you still have input, you still have knowledge, you can support that movement or that activity. How can we add you to that mix, right? And that's where, you know, have the virtual spaces coming in with, with Haifa. Um, that's now starting to include um, the, the bioregions too. So we have built Haifa to support Haifa, but now it's, it's the bioregions that we're looking at next. So each bioregion can have its own DAO, right? Um, and they can define how their structure looks like, right? They have certain uh, roles that make sense for their own bioregion. They can pull in the people from their bioregion and then uh, define the very same work, you know, similar processes that we're already using, you know, sociocratic principles uh, that we're using in the DOE for organizations can also apply for a bioregional context, right? So, so this is where then they can invite their members and then uh, instill the reward processes too, right? So they get rewarded in tokens uh, for 
um, for uh, the, the bioregional token, the, uh, the seeds token, and uh, the voice tokens too, right? Um, so they'll get that through the door, right? Um, and that's all defined and transparent too, right? Um, it's, it's all there for everybody else to see. There's nothing hidden away, right? There's no hidden committee somewhere who makes these decisions for bioregions. They own that piece, right? But, and the same is true now for the work teams on the ground, right? The other on the ground. Um, it's all there. Um, if you want to join a work team, you can. If you want to participate in a lower capacity, like 5 or 10% commitment level, um, that's, that's good too. And but it's funny, we recently redefined what it means to say, what is, what is commitment here? This is not a time-based metric. This doesn't mean, you know, you have your 40 hours a week, you spend five hours on that stuff. It's, it's your stake, um, your skin in the game, basically. How much of your life do you want to invest kind of in, in, in this project? And if you say you're 100% there, then that means you have nothing else around you, right? There's no other side project <laughs> working on you there, you know, for us, for, you know, with everybody else here. Um, but if you have other things on the side, of course, we don't want to say, you know, you have to do all the work here. Uh, you can say so, right? And you can adjust that too, right? So your commitment can change over time and your commitment can apply to different circles within the organization too, right? If you want to look at uh, product design, you know, come here in a role, you know, if you look at uh, marketing outreach, you know, join us here for a while, right? That's all very, f very fluid right now and uh, can change that picture can change with uh, with the door. Um, uh, we're, we're working on another feature now with uh, editing smart contracts, which apparently is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> I thought that's, you know, smart contracts are really not like uh, databases, right? That you can just go in and change values. It doesn't work that way. You really have to be careful about the business rules that you imply with with a smart contract. So we're doing now a new thing, uh, which is which allows you to edit and modify your smart contract. Could be, you know, your commitment change, changes, you know, based on the role you, you were taking on. Um, but you still have to go through a proposal process, right? So any changes on that object means you have to come back to your circle or wider circle to approve that kind of change, right? So they can see that and it becomes again visible to everybody else. So things like that, I think, play an important role to anchor people, you know, to, to activities on the ground. Cool. Well. Um, Joachim, uh, how does voice compare to VAS? I've heard a, a different project that sounds kind of similar, but not quite the same. I'm not quite sure the difference is, though. Do you know uh, what I'm talking about? Voss, no, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. But I mean, for us, voice is, is an unfungible token, so you can't transfer that. It's what you, you make build over time, right? So the longer you stay, um, the more voice you gather. So if you actually claim a role, so to me, mm -hmm. roles are more long-term things, right? So you say you want to build something with others for, for a longer term you get more voice versus uh, you have a one-time contribution, right? So a quick thing you do um, almost like a bounty. You don't get as much voice for that. Um, you get your token reward for that, you know, your seeds uh, in terms of what you earn uh, for your contribution. But we want to encourage people to stay in these longer term uh, relationships with the organization. So that earns them more, more voice, right? And, and, the voice, and, and the voice is also important in regards to the context, right? So if we introduce bioregions now into the dough, that means your voice, of course, counts a lot more if you make decisions within the bioregional context, right? Uh, as opposed to people who are outside the bioregion and not, not related directly to that. So they have a lower voice versus higher voice. So there's an incentive for people to actually stay within a different context, right? I'm here, you know, I'm physically here. So of course, that's my bioregional context. Or virtually, I'm part of this organization in a specific role. So I have a stronger voice over here, right? Are the tokens then tradable for... Um, um, government currency or how does it work uh, when people are 100% committed in the project? Yeah, so, so these are non-tradable. These are tokens you earn over time and mm -hmm. uh, you apply in different contexts. So we have it uh, used in the passport, for example. So there's, there's a token 
capacity for you to vote on proposals that you see in the passport, which is more on a global level, more regional level, right? Um, where you can apply these tokens and in the passport, we have different rule sets there. So they would expire and then they have to be replenished, you know, over time. So you can't, you know, suddenly change a, you know, a lot with, with many tokens. I think what um, you're, uh, like what you're, what the context that Analu is missing is that those are kind of like voting tokens. Like they're kind of like your reputation. Mm -hmm. So if you have more voice, if there's a decision to be made, then when you weigh in, you have more influence. So it's, is, is that the context, is that correct? Like, I think that's the context that she might be missing. Is that they're more like a influence token than a trade, you know, they're not a monetary token, they're more like influence. Is that correct? Did I get that right? Joachim, is that correct? That the voice token is more like an influence oh, or reputation? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, if you ask me, is of course. Correct? Yeah, yeah. That's, so it's, that's perfect, yeah. yeah. That, that's so that the more it. you've contributed to the project, the more, influence you have on the decisions that are made in the democracy which is one of the ways that you know it's precisely what we're talking about here is okay how do we expand beyond that core team and still have something fair it's like as people contribute to the project they're going to have more reputation or voice or influence and it's not yeah, it's not transferable and, and and you're saying it expires and then it can be renewed so that if somebody's inactive, they can't suddenly jump in after a year and start, you know, about something that particularly pissed them off that day or something. <laughs> <laughs> Not that people ever do that. <laughs> thank you. All right. yeah, I hope this helped. I don't know. Thank yeah. you for that question. It looks like we're winding down. So, you know, as far as the uh, participation, so maybe we'll just everybody kind of can do a quick closing round. Um, you know, what did you get? What? Are you taking from the session? It has started raining cats and dogs where I am. So like I'm extremely distracted by like all this wind and everything's going on around here. So that's my closing. <laughs> Anybody else have some things to say for closing around? I want to say uh, thanks for the presentation, Joaquin. That was very interesting. I'll look more into it and the things I'm coming out with is thinking how this transition of oligarchy and more non-hierarchical decentralized organizations have so much to do with our relationship to power and, and efficiency. So it seems like it's at two extremes that have to be balanced somehow. Thank you, everyone. I'll say something in closing. So um, yeah, I mean, this is a really interesting topic for me for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, I'm working with a bunch of different DAOs, but um, yeah, I'm especially, I, I mean, there's a lot, I think there's a lot more. I mean, this is a really, really deep topic. Um, and uh, I'm especially interested in some of the things that Thomas brought up earlier, like how do you how do you future proof something so that it doesn't go oligarchy decentralized and back to oligarchy? How does how do you avoid it being captured? That's I don't think we touched on that, but that's really that's probably the most important topic to me. Um, it was yeah, I mean it was interesting to hear people talking about stuff. So thanks for letting me join. Yeah, how Laura, talking closing remarks? It was um, quite interesting to hear um, everybody's remarks. Um, I really um, appreciate um, Joachim's um, presentation, and I think I will probably re um, watch this presentation and consider it based upon the reputation um, aspect. I was a little bit confused at the beginning. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, thank you. From my end, um, Grace, you're always doing a phenomenal job of getting everybody on, 
into this space, right? Thinking about what we can do next, you know, pushing the boundary. It's so important. We have to be inclusive and open to all these ideas that are on the table, right? We've got to do this together. Um, otherwise, we're not going to succeed with that. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at so many ideas and trying to incorporate it in so many ways. So always glad to be here, Grace, and share what we have and learn what others are bringing to the table here. Thank you. Yes, from my side, as usual, we start in one place, then we kind of veer off into other places, which are always interesting. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, uh, one more time, thank you, Grace, for organizing this. Awesome, my pleasure. And next week, I'm going to try and get the guys from Diversify to come in and talk about how they made this transition. And if not, you know, come ready next week to present your own project because that's the last week of the month is what are you up to week. So I'll see you then. Great. Thank you. Take care, Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.